Welcome back, everybody, to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am joined today by the one, the only, I can't even believe that I'm, you know, sitting here about to talk to this man, the great Kevin Kelly, author, um, um, co-founder of Wired Magazine, uh, and just, you know, futurist, legend, you know, the original um, VR guy, the original tech guy. I mean, just, you know, Mr. Kelly, thank you so much for doing this. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's a privilege and honor. Thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Cool, cool. So I, I I think I have the audience at a little bit of a disadvantage that, you know, maybe grew up a little bit later and doesn't know um, as much about you as I do. So I'd like to kind of take a little bit of a step back and talk a little bit about your early days um, because, you know, you have an incredibly interesting uh, sort of um upbringing and i'm not talking about when you were a child i'm talking about more intellectually when you were a young man and you kind of went off on your journey uh to asia with mm -hmm. a camera to go just photograph stuff and this is way before you had <laughs> done wired magazine mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff so can you tell me a little bit about what motivated you mm -hmm. and how all that came about for me a real trigger and spark to do what I was doing came from reading the whole earth catalogs mm. which were published in the late 60s. 69 was the first one just as I was graduating from high school and um, that gave me permission to kind of invent my own life. Um, well, sorry to interrupt but could you explain a little bit about what the whole earth catalog yeah. is? I think there's a lot of people have no idea what that even is. Absolutely. It is um, started by Stuart Brand, and um, it's hard to kind of convey the poverty of information that, that was present when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s. The, the impossibility of learning anything on your own was really, really hard. Mm. Let's just say you wanted to learn how to do, make something, or build or repair it. Where would you go? There was no books on it. Mm. You weren't at the library. You couldn't go to a bookstore and get it. There was no internet. Right. If you weren't lucky to live next door to somebody who knew, and you knew that they knew, you were stuck. And that was the state of um, the world, not just for someone living way out in the boonies, but even for me living in suburbia of New York City. It was still really, really hard. The whole Earth catalog, in some ways, we, we could think of it almost like the internet on newspaper. Mm. It was a reader written catalog. People would submit things in to the editor, Stuart, who would look at them and approve or not. And then they would publish it really quickly in a kind of a do it yourself fashion on cheap newsprint and send it out to the subscribers. And um, people would say, here's the best little self published book on how to mm -hmm. mine for pan for gold or how to build your own home out of hay bales, or uh, how to do homeschooling, or how to travel the world for $5 a day. <laughs> right. And then you would open up this thing and you would see, oh, here's some information about how to do stuff. And that was um, what triggered me and kind of prompted me to, to um, I say, uh, to take a different path. So I um, decided to drop out of college. I went one year and I went to, I wanted to be a photographer, which was just the beginning. What, of, what was your major? Of, uh, I'm fascinated yeah, yeah, by yeah. that thought. What I was, I was a geology major at the wow. University of Rhode Island. I was a science nerd in school. I was a science and art. I took every single science and math course our college prep offered. I doubled up every year, and then I doubled up on art. And um, I was thinking of going to either art school or to MIT. Right. And I should have gone to art school. If I'd gone to RISD instead of URI, I probably would have stayed in school. But um, there was no gap year at that time. There was no interning ship. It was just kind of like, it was like grade 13, sitting in the same desks, another grade. I was like, I was going to go out of my mind. Mm. So um, the whole catalog came along and said, hey, here's, here's, here's a do-it-yourself version of the world. Do your own education. Invent your own things. Here's some tools for making your own, you know, VW van conversion. And so um, so I kind of paid attention to that and I decided to pursue photography 
I had a friend who was studying Chinese in Taiwan. He invited me to Taiwan, wow. which I went to in 1972. I saved up $300 <laughs> to buy a plane ticket. And um, it blew my mind. Uh, I grew up, I never had Chinese food. I never hold chopsticks. I didn't know anything. And then mm. here is this entire world um, just transforming itself a different way of doing things. And it was like, okay, this is my university. Mm. And after a decade of traveling there, I awarded myself an honorary degree in Asian studies. Mm. And um, so that was sort of how I set off. And kind of inadvertently, there was no grand plan. It was just that I knew that I couldn't stay in school. And I was resigned to the fact of being a poor hippie most of my life, but at least... I had control of my time. Mm. And at least I was sort of making my art, which was photography. And um, I was very content with, with that arrangement. And back in those days, um, when you went out there, and um, I believe if folks want to see the photography that, that, that you did, you can Google Asia Grace um, on, oh, no. on Google. Va Vanishing Asia is even better. Vanishing Asia. Um, there's, there's a... There's a, there's a um, a Amazon, you can buy it on Amazon. It's three volumes. I spent 50 years photographing every part of remote Asia and I accumulated and printed in the books 9,000 of the best images. Wow. Over a thousand pages. It was a Kickstarter campaign. And um, that was my result of 50 years of traveling in the most remote parts of Asia. And not just, you know, like Bangkok and stuff. I mean, like way, way into the boondocks into the villages and i was documenting the disappearing cultures over those 50 years while i was doing my other things this was sort of my my passion project so so how did you transition from you know like like you yeah. said a hippie traveling through asia right. to come back to america and literally invent tech media how, right how, how, so, how did that happen yeah it was not on purpose because i had the kind of hippie allergy to big tech i owned nothing i had a bicycle i had a camera um i was not interested in computers um my dad kind of worked with computers and i was definitely not interested in that he kept saying look at this fortran it's like what i don't want that so um it came about in a kind of a weird way which was um i started writing for the whole earth catalog uh, reviewing travel guides oh wow and okay. um, because that was something I knew. But by that time, there was one thing I knew more than anybody else in the world. And that was really adventuresome travel on the cheap into remote places. And so I started to review. And then I started my own mail order business, importing and sending out budget travel guides. There was this guy named Rick Steves, who um, was had his own little self-published book to Europe. And I started selling his thing. And there was this couple um, uh, Maureen and um, Tony Wheeler, they had this um, uh, some book, a book called Lonely Planet. Mm -hmm. And then there was Bill Dalton with his moon. So I started importing these um, travel guides when nobody knew about them. That's interesting. And then I started reviewing them for this whole earth catalog. I knew something. I was sharing. It was like a blog post. And um, th they invited me to come work on the magazine, which was my dream job, at, at the same time that the people on the existing um, publications were getting into computers. They started to review software as well as books. This was and what year is this, roughly? This Just is around 1982. Wow, okay. Just to get a little context. Right. So it was pretty early. There was something happening with personal computers. Stuart had always um, been interested in them as personal tools. Mm-hmm. And um, I was fine with that. Um, and then I had uh, a conversion experience. Mm. I, did, I, 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 I noticed that there was something happening on these emergent online things that were still private. There was no public internet. There was these private online services. Later on, there was Prodigy. But this was even before this. This was the Eyes Network, and there was something called um, Western Behavioral Institute. And... Um, I got invited through the horror catalog to look at them. And I realized, oh my gosh, this is a whole new country. Mm. And I decided to write a story 
like a travel story, as if this was like another country. Mm. I call, and it was this other online world, this territory. And so I got a job to basically look at these other online worlds That's and um, to write about them as if they were a different country. And the way that that came about is I was doing my catalog, my mail order catalog from my bedroom. And rather than pay someone to typeset it, which is what you had to do in the old days, mm -hmm. I had an Apple IIe from the, the lab that I worked in a science lab at the University of Georgia. And there was an Apple IIe there. And I said, I was a terrible typist. I just said, I don't, I, I don't want to have to retype this. <laughs> there must be some way for me after I've written this in Apple that I could just send it and have a typeset. And so I found a local newspaper that could take the data from a modem, a 300 baud modem. You know, yeah. <laughs> I've been there. They could they could take the data that I had already typed up and they could make it really nice, look like it was like printed. And I said, that's perfect. Well, here's the thing. I had this modem to send the data to the thing. And that data and that modem allowed me to go to these bulletin boards. Sure, BBSs. The BBSs. And that's where I discovered it. So because when I went to the BBSs, it was like this feels like an Amish barn raising. This feels very <laughs> organic. This technology is not about, it's not steamrolling. It's not, it's, it's not industrial. There's something very organic yeah. about this. I want to know more about it. And that's when I decided to write about it. And then I started to get onto these things. And that was the big epiphany. It was like, oh my gosh, this is technology that is building communities. This is about mm. communication. This is a whole different Jesus. idea of communication of technology than, than I've ever thought of. And so we became involved at Whole Earth in trying to start our own bulletin board called The Well in 1984. And then we wanted to open it up and make it as free as possible. And then eventually we, we connected it to the Internet and we became the first public access to the Internet for a long time in the 80s. The only way you could get on the internet was if you had a um, a dot eu, um, if if you were part of a university or a really big sure, company. with with telnet and signet. There was no other way, and so yeah. we offered the first public access. We said if you pay us eight dollars a month for the well account, you can get linked or connected to the internet, which nobody had ever heard of. This is That's way incredible. before the web, let alone the web. Yeah. So so I came through in kind of a backdoor way of looking at it as a different country that they were barn raising these um, little communication bulletin boards that later became whole platforms. And that experience made me rethink all technology. And then as mm -hmm. the other technologies came along, I could see them in a different way. I, I saw the more organic human biological face to them. And I, actually attended the first conference for artificial life in 89 with that idea in mind. And that's when I started thinking about out of control about the fact that mm. there really wasn't that much difference between nature and technology. Sure. There was lots of similarities. And, and I began this whole journey of rethinking technology. First of all, that's absolutely fascinating as somebody who's literally grown up with your words now understanding this sort of this prologue of you kind of learning how to write from the perspective of somebody with a complete blank slate, right? Because yeah. you're 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 an adventurer going into a land that you have zero context about. Yeah. So you're you're able to soak in all of the data with no preconceived notions, and that's the same thing that you applied in your sort of delving into technology, which has allowed you to mm -hmm. gain all this insight without so much bias, right? Like the bias is always going to be there, but it's, it's sort of pushed down a little bit when you admit that you're visiting some unknown territory. Wow. I didn't know that. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't know that. No, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so out of control, my first book, which was about decentralized systems and very complicated, complex adaptive systems is, is really, my exploration of this of this realization and kind of uh, like saying, 
can can we look at the world of technology and robots and stuff and see them with slightly different a eyes see right. them from kind of within the technology itself as a, as a system and um um so you've heard of richard dawkins famous book called the selfish gene of course and what he does there is he plays a little trick a little thought experiment he says what if we just viewed all of biology through the eyes of genes mm. you know that, that basically you know an egg is just the chicken is just an egg's way of making more eggs right mm. and so um he has children and obviously he's not looking at his kids only as genes but it's it's one way to look at it and i through this experience began to look at technology in a trying to see it from a slightly different point. What if, what would the world look like through the eyes of technology? And um, that's what I began to kind of to explore. And over time, you know, I became a kind of reluctant technological optimist and determinant. <laughs> it wasn't something I set out to do. It was something that I kind of changed my mind about as I went along. Yeah, I, uh, I have to share this story with you because it's been literally with me since I was in college. And Out of Control, to me, is a seminal book. I put it up there with Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass, with Jorge Luis Borges's Ficciones and Labyrinths. I mean, it was that important to me. And there was one thing, I'm getting chills even thinking about it. There was one thing that I read in that book, and I'll never forget, I was in the subway, and you had uh, this whole um, sort of thought about how the previous generation could be identified with a symbol and that symbol was the atomic uh, mm. power symbol and that the forthcoming generation the one that we weren't in yet right the one that we were th maybe on the precipice of was going to be an amorphous network and that all software companies all startups if you want to have a good idea it has to coincide with network thinking. Mm -hmm. right. And to me, I I remember reading that back then and, and thinking, this is the most important thing I've ever read in my <laughs> life. And everything you said came out absolutely true. It's like, mm -hmm. if I could, you know, if I could travel back in time, you know how people try to travel back in time yeah, to, make, yeah, yeah. to uh -huh. get rich, I would go to myself in the sub when I say, you, you know that stuff that you're reading that Kevin Kelly's telling yeah. you? That's exactly what you should think about 24 hours a day is how to build networking right, social right, right, technologies. Right. Right. Because this was before anything. I mean, this is before yeah. literally anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, and, and so it's like, as somebody who's been labeled a futurist, I don't think that label is better presented on anybody than you, Mr. Kelly. So thank yeah. you once again for being here. This is just well, amazing. They're very, they're very kind words. I appreciate that I, I don't call myself that a futurist because I'm very aware of um, how nearly impossible it is to figure out the future. I think mm. the best we can do is to predict the present, which is difficult mm. enough. Sure. Just being able to see what's going on is, is the challenge. For instance, like, like right now, there's you know all this talk of AI and of course, but what's actually going on? What are they actually doing? Let's not even talk about the future. Let's just talk about what actually happens and how it how it's changing how people do things right now, and yeah. that's hard enough. And then we can kind of extrapolate a little bit from that. But but that is the challenge. The challenge is people are talking about this and they're imagining all kinds of things, but they're not really looking at what is actually happening. Yeah, with, with them currently. And so um, so I, I spend most of my time not really trying to think about the future as much as like, can I really see what's going on now? 1000%. And, and even in Out of Control, in Out of Control, even though like, when did you publish that book? When did it actually come out? It actually came out in 94. Uh, first of all, it's incredible. It's Out of Control, I think, is a precursor to like the Matrix in a way, right? Yeah, it's that it it's that important in terms of getting that hive mind, living in the yeah, machine, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And um, currently my day job, I own a VR development studio, which I mm -hmm. know that you've done a ton of work in VR. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I heard you say is whatever your startup 
you know, and look, and please, everybody, listen carefully. Whatever your startup idea is, and I heard you say this just recently, mm -hmm. plus AI, right, right, right. Now, now it's a good startup idea. So right, in right, my right. particular VR project, which if you have a VR headset, I'd love to show you. If not, I can even ship one mm -hmm. out to you, um, is a VR social networking platform. But um, as part of creating the sort of UGC around it, it's all through AI assisted design because, you know, uh, the barrier to enter to make software is very, very, very high, as I'm sure you know. And AI, what it really does is sort of lowers that barrier of creation to just natural language. And the evolution of that is going to be so incredible that we we got to figure out how we control it before it goes truly out of control. Sure, sure. So um, I just finished a, or I wrote a piece for Wired recently called The Engines of Wow, mm. which was about the AI image generators who, you know, like um, Dolly and Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is like, what are they doing? What's going to last? Is this just kind of like VR, something mm -hmm. that is going to wow people and then not take 20 years to sure. come about? And um, there are several conclusions from from that, but one of the ones per that pertaining to what you're saying is that um, I think we're at peak 2D image. Mm. I think that this most of the AI image that's generated is going to be used for where no images have been generated so far, where there's just blank spaces. So it's not going to, nobody's going to lose their job, first of all. No artist is going to lose their job to, due to AI. They'll work with this as a partner. But the main point is that the, this is really not going to change making still images or even photography. The superpower with this AI, generative AI, is in making VR, is in making 3D worlds mm -hmm. cinema. Be because those creations are so far beyond a single individual sitting in the bedroom being able to do it. You can, almost anybody can make an image, you know, a 2D image, uh, uh, you know, a painting by themselves. They may take a while, but they can do it by themselves. But you're not going to produce a whole world Mm, by very difficult. You, but you will be able to very soon with very soon. the AI generators. And that is the superpower when, you know, when you lower the bar to making a movie mm. by an individual. And the, most of those movies are going to be crap, but some of them will be absolutely astounding. Yeah. Of course, you can still make them with a whole crew and that's even better. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I agree with you that I think, um, I think these the AI in, involved in making 3D and 4D is really where it's the real news, the real the real difference. Yeah. But but the second thing I want to say is, yeah, I think you know you can predict the future, which is basically you know X plus AI, whatever it is, <laughs> add AI. However, because that, because it is so easy. Just adding AI to things is not enough because because AI is going to be a commodity, right. and the the real the real thing is going to be in the interface to it or the other reasons. It's like you know, it's like selling water. Yeah, water is free, but how could you ever make a business selling water? Well, you've got to brand it. There's something else about it. There's there's a special uh, handle into it, whatever it is. And so that's just, that's going to be the thing with AI plus whatever it is is that there's going to be like thousands of people taking X, the same X and adding AI. And that's not enough. It's, it's, it's doing it with you adding something else. I should say it's, you know, it's X plus AI plus something else plus mm. Y. You have to add some other special juice to just a combination of AI. Just adding AI is not anywhere near enough. I, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things I'm, I'm very into that whole AI thing Um and the one that I've taken a particular kind of obsession with is one that you mentioned called Stable Diffusion because it's open source and there's right. quite a quite a, a healthy community around right. it. But to me, the one thing that I've realized, and I think that people, you know, the normies don't really understand this part of it yet because, you know, they're just like, here's an AI app. I type whatever weird prompt you know, Donald Trump is a clown and I get some random image. 
But what they don't really understand is that the magic of it is in teaching the AI a very specific language, right? Like a lexicon that is really endemic to the stylistic output that you want from your prompt, right? So right, right. for me, the sort of storefronts of the AI world are going to be the checkpoint files, the LoRa embeddings, the textual inversion embeddings, all of these data sets that people curate individually. And those create a specific result because the creator is in the references, right? It's like when, when somebody's smart, typically they're able to give a ton of great references, right? And like, you know, they, they know all the references to every movie. So now I think that this guy's a film expert. The same thing is with AI. If you train the AI with very specific models, not just the wide sweeping scraping mm -hmm. that Google does, the results that you get are like night and day from like the sort of stable diffusion 1.5 or DALI 2.0. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. The other day, me and my buddies, we have a band that we've had forever, right? You know, every every good hippie has a good rock and roll band, right? So, you know, so um, I I took 300 of the best rock and roll album covers that I personally like, fed them into Stable Diffusion Laura, which is a, you know, like a training model. And me and my buddies just couldn't believe how good the output was of all of our ideas as an album cover, taking this amalgam of 300 of the greatest album covers of all time and creating a language based on that to give you something completely original. Yeah. And, you know, you know, that, that to me is the beauty of AI that I think gets lost on people that are just kind of getting into it because they see it as like, Oh, I can do a picture of myself as a wizard, you know, like they're kind of missing the real creative power that the AI will unleash. I think. Right, right, right. So I, th I think you said a couple of things that I think are really important, but I may expand them a little bit. Please. It, it is absolutely um, true that, that um, as we go forward, we're going to have artists who will, um, they'll partner with these AIs and they'll become legitimate partners where they're working on together. Mm. And that's the whole thing. This is a partnership. So you are, learning how to talk to the AI and the AI is learning how to talk to you. You're learning how to listen to the AI and the AI is learning how to listen to you. Both of those things are going on. So there's AI whispers who become really, really, really good at talking to the AI, mm -hmm. prompting it just the right things. They know how to manipulate it. And at the same time, if they're smart enough, they're having the AI learn from them. And together, the two of them are going to go on a journey into developing their art and mm -hmm. so it's a real true partnership that works both ways and um right now we have these you know humongous big data driven generic um ais like say imogen from google or something sure where there is no real advantage to you personally um, but you but it le learns very fast because it's learning from everybody mm -hmm. um and so um the second thing I want to say is there going to be, there's not a single AI. It's AIs, plural. There are going to be yes. many, many varieties. Already, all the artists recognize that there's a difference in quality working with DALI or Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, you know, whatever the ones are, they're all a little different. They all have their own personalities, and it's like having a different kind of paintbrush. Yeah. You know, we use this for this kind of thing and this for this, and maybe you favor – watercolor kind of stuff. And so you're going to go this way. You're going to develop it deep. You're going to have your own brush that's modified and you're going to produce things. And that's the partnership that we're going to see. And that's, again, goes back to this idea. It's, it's like the interface. It's like what you do with this AI. Sure. The AI is cheap. It's available. It's a commodity. You have to kind of make it yours and you have to, um, uh, you'll specialize it in some way. Mm. Can, can I ask a question that could potentially be a little bit touchy? And if it is, we can yeah. skip right over yeah. it. No. Uh, one of the big topics, and it's frustrating to me, is that, and the reason why I stopped using DALI uh -huh. altogether, and I'm looking for alternatives even to GPT, um, which is the censorship of the AI at yeah. a high level. What yeah. are your thoughts on that? Do you think it is the responsibility 
of the people that sort of control in the more closed systems like DALI and OpenAI, do they have a responsibility to censor it? Or do you feel like there shouldn't be censorship on that technology? Well, they're, they're private companies and they certainly have every right to censor it for their own purposes. So one of the, one of the reasons I know Google told me they haven't released their ones is that they basically want to be the Disney of AI. Mm. They want to have PG. They right. want to have things that the kids can use and they don't have to worry about. It's that's, their a very, that's a very legitimate business concern. Fine. Mm -hmm. So they're saying we're going to control what it is. That's their business. Now, there are others who say, I want, I want the porn. I want the gore or whatever it is. And so there'll be people serving that. I mean, that's, that's, that's capitalism. It's a free market. Sure. So, um, and then there'll be, then there'll be the, um, you know, the Photoshop level where, where, where you are, um, no one's controlling what you say on Photoshop. It's just on your computer. And so that's, you know, stable diffusion has the versions where you can load on your computer. And for those who want, I think there'll be a lot of AI um, that are going to be local and, and you have total control of it and total responsibility for mm. what it produces. And so, um, I think it's right now we're just at this moment where most of where where the all the AI that we have right now is really driven by big data it requires billions of examples to train it. That's not always going to be true, mm. but right now that's true. And so that's why you have these big companies doing it, and they're kind of dependent on these big companies. And so you have a big company corporate mind, but that's not going to be true for very long. And we're going to have um, smaller data sets and smaller companies producing it, and they will have more niche things. And so this issue of, of censorship will be like, well, yeah. I mean, if you don't like the fact that Disney censors their movies, and they literally do, of course, in terms of what they're playing on, well, you go somewhere else. And we'll have enough choices that this is really not going to be an issue. It's different when the government is, is running it, um, and because in fact, literally, we want to reserve the word censor for something governments do rather than just... Um, what corporations do it's it's corporations a great point doing, it's not really censoring in that technical sense of the word um and so um so i'm not worried about it yeah there, there's like look in my uh, um vr platform um we ran it so in my vr platform we have fully three-dimensional chat gpt bots that you can talk to Mm -hmm. And they do like voice synthesis and they reply to you mm -hmm. with voices. And I'm a big George Lucas fan and we modeled George's voice and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's a lot of fun. It's intended for entertainment, you know, right. but if you go to my chat GPT right now and, you know, you ask it to tell you a poem about Trump versus Biden, the, you know, the output is extremely different and it, it's, it's a little bit concerning that it's so sort of obvious, you know, where it's like, I think for the first time in technology that I can remember, it's been that in your face, you know, regardless of what your point of view is, it should, it shouldn't be so obvious when you're dealing with a, with a canvas, which way the canvas is skewing, if that makes sense. And that to me is a little, you know, it's a little concerning, but to your point, they're a private business. They could do whatever the heck they want. And to your point, there's going to be many, many AIs so that maybe, you know, right now, ChatGPT just happens to be the only one that has an Unreal Engine API, so it's very easy to use, versus some of the alternatives that aren't really out in the wild yet. Yeah, I mean, like, how long is, you know, ChatGPT? It's like three months old, four months old? It's just something <laughs> crazy. I mean, people are expecting the, the whole thing to be solved. Um, we, we just have to to calm down a little bit because um, sure. um, there'll be plenty of choices very, mm -hmm. very fast. If, if, if what you say is um, felt by other people, enough other people, there's a business opportunity. Absolutely. That people will fill that. And so I, I'm just not concerned. Here's what it is. This is a tractable problem. This is a problem that will be solved by capitalism. Right, right, right. So, so I don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Fair enough. There are other issues in AI that are a lot more 
difficult to to to, to solve. Yeah, but that one I'm just not just not worried about. What one thing um, that I kind of was known for maybe like two three years ago, um, you know, won a Webby Award for it was the creation of deep fakes. Um, mm -hmm. specifically around, you know, comedy deep fakes. And mm -hmm. my topic was George Lucas. He's been kind of a muse mm -hmm. of mine of trying to create that sort of Android George. Right. And, um, and that technology, even back then, my models from back then, even today are still scary accurate, you know, right. and it's the idea of even with something like stable diffusion or Dali uh -huh. creating a likeness and creating a false image of somebody can take identity theft to the next level. And that to me really is the most concerning part is that yeah. discerning the truth is going to be embedded in the metadata. It's like some kind of Neil Stevenson dystopian novel where the only truth is in hidden metadata, you know, that nobody yeah. even knows how to access. Yeah. I actually, you know, at Whole Earth in 1984, I think it was, Oh, funny enough. <laughs> um, we I, we did a cover story for the magazine that I was editing, and it was uh, titled uh, The End of Photography as the Evidence of Anything. Mm. And it was about uh, this machine called the Cytex, which basically was Photoshop, but it cost $2 million. Oh, wow. $2 million. Cytex, Israeli-made machine that the big com companies like Time Life and um, and National Geographic were using to do a little touch up, but it was Photoshop. And so we made some images. This was like again, 1984, there was no Photoshop. We made some images, Photoshop some images. And it was like, no, we were saying, you're no longer gonna be able to use photography as the evidence of truth. Mm. So this has been long in coming, and now we're at the point where text it doesn't matter what it is. We can't tell immediately by looking at it whether a piece of text, a photograph, a world, a three D image, music, whether a sound, whether that's true. So we have to, we're now kind of like in a new era where we have to have a different way of ascertaining truth. And I find it really ironic that people have decided that the way to check GP, um, GPT-3 um, when they say things is to check Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's right, interesting. Right, right. Talk about a simulacrum. Yeah, that, that, right, that, right. Well, yeah, I yeah. Mean, they, 25 years ago, we would have laughed that off the block. Right, um, right. When people didn't believe Wikipedia was ever going to amount to anything. And now it's like checking whether AI is true or not. So... Um, you, so, you, so 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 this is uh this is a real challenge to figure out how to do this because um th this is a real thing i mean the, the, the it's not just an individual assignment this is an assignment for google and microsoft and stuff how can they make an ai that will say something that you can trust sure i mean it's a very 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 difficult problem yeah that, that that starts to go into the realm of how do we know anything is true? Yeah, and, and you had a, a very valuable lesson about this, um, which I've taken to heart, and it's a very difficult lesson, but I heard you say, and I'm not exactly sure where this quote came from, but I definitely attribute it to you, that because nowadays, even if you wanna know a story, you hear something on the news, and on one outlet, it's presented with this bias. On another outlet, it's presented with that bias. You have no idea which one to believe. And you said that a good rule of thumb is to try to go seven sources deep. Right. You know, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I think that that's a very interesting sort of right, mental right, right, right. discipline. So that came from this, my little book here, my new little book, Excellent Advice for Living. And it was about, um, it, this was actually something I learned from having researchers. And in the research world, the idea was is that if you went out to somebody who you thought would knew and asked them something and they say, I don't know, you would say, well, who, who does know? Mm. And then you, they say, well, maybe this person. And if you were willing to do that seven steps or and if, likewise, if you went somewhere and there was a footnote to a book that source of that book and you went to that and 
that source didn't have it, but they had a footnote. And you went if you were willing to go seven steps down in this, um, you know, degrees of separation, basically, mm. you would find your answer. But you had to be willing to do those seven um, levels to, to 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 find something, and um, and that's sort of in some senses what these AIs are going to have to do is they're going to have to start to go down and look at what the source is that's right and then check the source and then maybe check the footnote to that source and so that's that's a very complicated thing but it seems like that's what we're going to have to teach these things to do they can't just look at wikipedia um and so um but but as an individual until that time comes as an individual if you are looking for something and are willing to do the seven steps you'll find your answer a, a very reliable answer yeah, the, the, the old uh, sort of ode to a Grecian urn, beauty is truth and truth is beauty is all you know and all you need to know. Those days are long gone. It, no. it seems like <laughs> those days, uh, you no, know. It's, it's, I mean, there is, there is a, a, a truth to beauty and a beauty to truth, but that's not sufficient. Mm. Um, you, you can't just tell something's truth because it's beautiful. We, we know that that's no longer, that that's not reliable. So, um and, and the, I think there's also, honestly, there's different kinds of truth, right? I mean, there's sure. a, there's all kinds of things. There can be a truth in fiction and a lie in a certain way, but that's not what we're talking about right now. Yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah. about actual factual things. And sure. so, um, so, so I think we're on a ride now where we're going to really advance as a civilization in trying to have, answer these questions about what do we need to know? How are we convinced that anything is true? And um, uh, Danny Hillis, my friend who did the connection machine, who actually made the knowledge graph that, that Google now runs on, mm. um, says that there's, um, there's in every, any language, whether it's English or Chinese, any statement that we make, there's um, th generic three things. There's a subject, verb, and object. That's a kind of a common universal structure and that's any kind of statement there's going to be the the you know the subject the verb and the object that's that's the structure of a statement but he said there's actually a fourth um element and that's the element that we're going to have to right now the web has structured language structured knowledge in that three triple tuple mm -hmm. but there's a quadruple version of it and that is who claims this mm -hmm. what is the source Right. making that claim and it turns out really the only way that we're going to be able to tell quickly whether something is true or not is really to rely on the source where does it come from and is the source reliable have they right. been reliable in the past so so what we're going to be doing is basically embedding the provenance the sources against things and maybe hopefully as they travel along they can retain the source or it can be easily detected and it's going to come back to reputation of the source is the source reliable and so one of the things i'd say when people if you're looking to try to evaluate whether a source is reliable mm -hmm. look at how often they post corrections mm, that's an interesting the angle. more corrections they post the more reliable they are oh first of all that's a beautiful statement that is a beautiful statement it's, it's not like if they have no, you don't want the one that has the least correction. No, you want to have the have the most corrections. Right, right. Because yeah, that's another one of your quotes, man. You're you're full of wisdom, and people that don't know Kevin Kelly, and it's beautiful that your new book is actually just a collection of these things, and we'll get into that in a second. But you know, I always sort of got from you this idea that you know failure is the key to success, right? Like failure right, is right. the key. Success maybe is the wrong word, but it's the key to knowledge and the key right, to right, growing, right, right. you know, to, you know, right, to right. growth. So that's a great point. The source that has the most corrections is the one that could probably be the most trustworthy. Right. Because they're acknowledging and there's some way to correct it. If, if there's a source with no corrections, it's like they're just not being honest. And so, um, they're not reliable. So, um, uh, I think this, again, I think this is something, I don't think we have an answer, but this is going to be the project for the next decade mm. is, is really kind of 
uh, working on this um, this 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 challenge, and um, you know, uh, deep fakes are going to get better and better. But they're also uh, another thing about this um, mm -hmm. determining whether something is true or not. It's also a matter of economics, and so um, if I, I think for a lot of things, we don't care whether they are true or not, like say in Hollywood movie. I don't care whether it's a stunt actor or the real actor or CGI actor. I don't care. I can't tell the difference. Right. And I don't care that I can't tell the difference. If something's put up as a illustration on a, on a blog post, I don't care whether it's made by a human or AI. Sure. I can't tell. I don't care. Um, there might be aspects in a documentary where there's somebody, it's, it's a resurrected, um, uh, like a George Lucas or something. And they're, and they're talking. And so like, um, maybe they blend, um, some old vintage stuff with some newly generated AI stuff. If, if the context is right, I don't care, mm -hmm. but there are some times when you do care, like in news, in news, you definitely care. Okay, and the thing is, when you do care, if you're willing to pay money, you can always find out. The AI will always reveal itself. There's always a ways to apply technology to determine whether or not something's been um, manufactured or not. And there's they're already making AIs that go into AIs to examine a picture, and the AI will be able to tell. So, but it costs money, and so um, so. In places where we care, we'll always be able to tell. Yeah. And so and so this idea that you can never tell, no, 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 we'll always be able to tell, but it may be expensive. It's sort of like um, the people who try and hide, um, go off the grid. They always say it's a matter of money. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but like the people who want to disappear, it's like, well, um, how much money are the people looking for you? Are they willing to spend to find you? Because that's how much you have to spend to hide. Right, right. So, like, if like right. if it's a couple thousand dollars, well, then you need a couple thousand dollars worth of privacy. If it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars that they're willing to spend, then you have to, you're going to pay a lot more to hide. Mm. If you're up against the U.S. government, they're going to find you because they have no <laughs> resources. Right, right. Yeah. Okay? So the same kind of thing is true in the 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 fakery, which is, it's a matter of economics. Um, if there's enough money involved, you'll be able to tell. But most yeah. of the time, we don't really care. Yeah, you know, that's why I, I've gravitated so much towards uh, stable diffusion in particular, because it is an open source technology. And to your point, the innovation around stable diffusion is primarily just in the interface, right? People mm -hmm. creating different GUIs for mm -hmm. it. And that's where the battle is happening, right? And like there's invoke versus automatic 1111 and then there's whatever, whatever. And that's where the innovation is happening. But the underlying technology is open. So it's easy to see the transparency in it, right? right? Like it's very easy to read the metadata if something has been created with this tool. And to me, it's almost like there needs to be some oversight over AI that maintains it to some degree, a transparent open source technology. Because to your point, if everybody starts to rely on the AI telling them if something is AI or not AI, that's a very easy thing to manipulate and nobody would know the difference, right? It's there's like- not, uh, a, But that's what I'm saying, there's, there's thousands of AIs. There'll be, th there's not a single AI, it's not monolithic. There are, there are a thousand different species, already three different species of um, image um, generated. Right. There'll be hundreds in by next year. There'll be thousands, and so right, um, right. most of these AIs are privately, and and they have they're run for business, and so they need to. If people don't like them or are unhappy with them, they're not going to buy it. They're not going to use it. They're going to go somewhere else. So there's this huge incentive to please the audience and the customers. And um, um, yes, you you'll because. Um, because there's a process involved that makes the image, that process is always contained in the image itself in some way. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll be able to tell if you 
need to or want to or are willing to pay that. And they will use AIs specifically made to, to determine this. The people will sell them you know, like, a, like a virus uh, identifier or, you know, like the guy who goes down the street looking for sniffs in your gas line. They're just <laughs> tools, tools that are going to be built because some people will want to know and, um, and they'll pay to find out and they'll be able to tell. And so um, uh, it's not a single AI run by some large company who has dominance. There's going to be thousands of them all competing yeah. for attention, for money, for dominance. And um, there will be network effect effects, going back to your network um, epiphany, where bigger AIs, the more people that use them, the better they get. And so we'll tend to want to use the big ones. But the disadvantage of using a big one is that you can't be special. Yeah. And so there will always be um, um, people being drawn off to use ones that are specialized to them. They may not learn as fast as the big ones. They may be harder to use than the big ones, but they will produce something that the big ones are not going to produce with you. And so, so there's a, there's a kind of countervailing force. Uh, yeah. That work. So um, I know I'm starting to run short on yep. time here, um, but there's a few things I wanted. One, one other thing that I, you know, that I've heard you speak of, and it's funny because there was a token, a, it was called the bat token or the, the something attention token that, that I've heard you speak about. Cause you just mentioned the concept of attention and the idea of attention being commodified at scale is something I've heard you speak of, which I believe is an interesting idea to sort of let out to my people a little bit because there is real value in all these folks are just trying to like get your attention to understand the value in your attention, I think is an important concept. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm not really sure what you're referring to, but, but my, my belief is that attention is still the scarcity. The one, human attention is the one mm -hmm. scarcity that we have. But right now we sell it for ridiculously cheap prices um, right we, we, we say it's the most valuable thing but if you look at the actual the actual costs of what we're willing to trade our attention for in other words the cost of say advertising to you and watching an ad if you watch an ad you're you're making 250 an hour or you're worth 250 an hour two dollars 50 cents an hour that's how much the advertisers are paying the right. companies for your attention so you are now worth 250 an hour that's ridiculous we should be charging people to read, um, <laughs> uh, you know, to reach me or whatever it is. Yeah. I, actually, I have this idea that we should actually, um, we may wind up paying people to watch an ad. I, I want to be paid to watch an ad. I'm not going to pay you to watch yeah. it. I, I yeah. want to be paid. So, um, so, I, so I think there is a lot of room right now to kind of, kind of play with this attention economy and, and maybe flip some of the, um, the directions right now. Because it really, human attention is really the true scarcity um, that we're headed up to, particularly as we have you know fewer people around. So I, I just wanted to kind of end and again remind people about this book, one thousand percent, which is about um, my seventy years of um, learning the hard way many things, and this is a book of advice that I'd wish I'd been given when I was younger, and sometimes some of this took me my entire life to kind of figure out. Um, and what I tried to do was to put it into a very condensed, distilled form, take a whole pages, whole life of advice and put it into something that was tweetable, could be transmitted easily. And read. yeah, that's what I thought when I was reading through it. It's amazing. It really is very, very good stuff. Because I want to be able to, I use them myself. Uh, and like, for instance, can I ask what, a question about this yeah. book? Uh -huh. uh, did you collect uh, because first of all, the book is um, just like he said, it's written in these almost um, tweet. Yeah, it's not tweets, but it is like in these shortened, condensed yeah, yeah. thoughts. Um, so it's a very easy book. It's a, it, it's the type of book that you literally have not to be crude or anything, but in the bathroom, right? It's like right, the right. perfect. It's you the, can pick it up anywhere and, and read it. Right. Yes. Yeah. It, it's the perfect pickup for three minutes book. Right, right, right. D did you have all of these thoughts collected or did you literally, when you sat down to write this book, um, kind of do them from front to back in a sort of like a memory recall? 
I started writing them around when I was 70 as a gift to my kids um, to give them some. And I, and I made the first time on my 78th birthday, uh, excuse me, 68th birthday. I wrote 68 of them. Yeah. And they, and I wrote them off the top of my head, but I, I discovered that other people really liked them and that I had more to say. So I started doing every year doing some, and I accumulated these over a number of years sitting down to, Say I I know I have something to say, a lot to say. But is there some way I can reduce this thing about say you know my philosophy about tool buying tools? Is there some way I can reduce this down to one sentence mm. that really is practical and useful, and yet memorable, and you could come back to it, and that way you could use it and it could be kind of uh, deep inside you. And so I would spend my time trying to take words away. Instead of expanding into stories, it was like, no, I want to make something that's just a sentence that, mm -hmm. that contains all this stuff. And so like an example would be that I use all the time is if I ha know I have something but can't find it in the house, when I finally do find it, I put it back in the place that I first looked for. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, that's the kind of thing. So that's a whole lesson there yeah. about that. But, but like, you know, like if you, when you find something, return it to where you first looked for it. There was one that I read because I've been reading the book and you were very kind to give me an early copy and I've been reading it. And there was one that's haunted me all day. And it's this idea that when you don't know something, it could be quite embarrassing. Right. But learning that same thing you don't know is actually quite admirable. Right. And the difference between the two is minimal. Right. Right. You right. Know? So, right, right. so it's like, like, like you don't say, oh, I can't swim, but I'm learning how to swim. Right. Is, it's is, the same is, exact thing, but two is, completely is, is, if different. If you really things. are learning, that's really good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. Like you know, I I I, I can't do calculus or algebra, but I'm, I'm learning it. Um, and so that's there's a huge difference. There. There's a whole uh, yeah different mindset. Like I've been um, sort of. I had an incident happen to me actually on 2001, and I've had this kind of fear of flying. Yeah. And and this year I actually got my private pilot's license. Wow. Right. So so it's like this thing where people, oh, how can you be afraid of flying? That's so ridiculous. Well, now I learned how to fly a plane and people say, wow, you know, so it's the yeah. same exact thing. When I read that, I was like, man, Kevin Kelly does it again. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, um, the book is called Excellent Advice for Living. It's not out yet. I, I no, believe, it's not right? out yet. Out in May, the beginning of May, it'll be out Viking a little hard cover so on amazon pre-order right now and there's about 450 little things like um you know some of it's kind of ancient wisdom that everybody knows for instance people can't remember more than three points from his speech <laughs> right. three right um and here's something i'm just taking these at random here's please, something please. that i believe that's really true that may be pertaining to your um audience is that there's uh, let me read it here Finite games are played to win or lose. And infinite games are played to keep the game going. So there's two kinds mm -hmm. of games in the world, finite games and infinite games. And finite games, there's winners and losers, and you can't change the rules. And infinite games are open-ended, oh, and they're made to kind of keep the game going. That's the whole purpose. And right. so you want to seek out infinite games right. Because, right. because there's an infinite upside to them. And they're not win or lose. And so my life has been about trying to find infinite games. Um, oh, beautiful, so, man. Right. So, yeah. So let me read the last one here. Please, please. So the last one is your basically your goal in life should be to arrive to the day before you die that you can say, I have fully become myself. Mm. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make everybody... Um, unleash their you know native genius and become the best you you can possibly be and these bits of advice to try to help you along in doing that so thank you for having me i really appreciate it Great oh man questions. thank you man you have no idea like again i'm sorry if i'm a little bit starstruck but like uh you really put me on a path to take my thoughts seriously as a young man when I read Out of Control, it, it was a life-changing experience. Well, that and makes me great, great pleasure because I have to tell you, Out of Control did not have a whole lot of fans when it was first published. Which is amazing yeah. to me. But, yeah, but it yeah, became yeah. 
because I read it around 98. So that's yeah, four yeah. years after it came out. It became right, right. more and more. Now yeah, it's, it's like a cult it's, classic. It's so better now. It sells better now than when it first came out. <laughs> right. Because everybody kind of dismissed it as kind of a wild, crazy California thing. Like, <laughs> right. So um, it's done a lot better now. And uh, thank you for being an early fan. I really appreciate that. An early yeah. appreciator. Um, I'm oh, sure you'll you. do great with your... Um, metaverse stuff right now um yeah, thank yeah. you for having me on i really appreciate it yeah and if do you have a headset not currently okay so there's the oculus quest headset yeah. is all self-contained which you sure. prophesized like five six years ago oh, yeah 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 that the headset was going to be all self-contained right, and all right, that right. stuff all that stuff came true by the way yeah you well know? it has a long way to go still by the way i mean i, I know i try to keep up with it as much as possible um and, you know, we've still got a couple field of view, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Sure, sure. So. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about it offline, but thank you so much, Mr. Kelly. Yep. Kevin Kelly, author, look him up, it, it, and you will just find countless and countless things of amazing knowledge and things that do truly change your life. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, and we'll see you guys next time. Okay.